At the Getty Museum out here in Los Angeles, there is a, a painting, an illustration from the 1400s, Moses defeating the Moors. And in the illustration, you see African people who are the Moors in Europe ruling. They're in a castle and they're battling white Europeans. And the reason why they named the painting Moses defeating the Moors is because the Europeans at the time, when they were going through the Inquisition, when they were going through the Reconquista, when they were getting the Africans called the Moors out of Europe, they had a religious undertone. And what they would do, they would draw stories from the Bible and tie that into their current struggle. And that's one of the things that gave them so much momentum. There was a religious undertone to it. The Africans of Europe originally came out of the Moors, came out of North Africa, out of the area that's known as Morocco ruled that area called the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. And it's interesting because what most people don't realize is that the Moors had brought to Western Europe before Europe even had developed uh, the technologies to do a lot of the things that they had done. And when the Moors had been defeated in 1492, that expulsion of the Moors, they, they had moved into areas that were now considered Western Europe. But they brought with them a lot of the technology, the science, the astronomy, irrigation for being able to, to, uh, to develop these lands. And that got erased out of history altogether. And I think that's part of the, the, the challenge now is to put that knowledge back into the mainstream so that people understand who the Moors really were. There's evidence of about 150 Moorish castles that are still there in Spain. And if you go to those castles, they will have a bilingual uh, description where they will tell you this was a Christian castle, but it was originally a Moorish one, and they'll tell you when it was Moorish and then when it became Christian. The churches in Spain were originally mosques. They will tell you the period where they were originally mosques and which period they became churches. The Moors then, when they came into Europe, they had already had elements of ancient African wisdom which allowed them to advance in ways that the Europeans had never imagined. And so in order to survive in this hostile environment, they had to go underground. The same thing happened with the Europeans who also were close to the Moors and other Arabs who had pieces of this knowledge. They found that this information allowed them to reinterpret uh, the history of the world, the science of the world, and that conflicted with, uh, with Christians, uh, specifically the Roman Catholic Church. So they also had to ban those people, and that led to the development of what we now call today secret societies, or more specifically, societies of secrets. And those secrets were the ancient educational knowledge that had been developed in Africa thousands of years earlier. Islam will rise up in the course of history by the sixth century, will cut off Europe from world trade by dominating North Africa and the Middle East. Europe was cut off totally from Asia, India, and Africa in terms of trade and access to wealth. So Europe would plunge into what we call the Dark Ages. But it was an economic depression that led to a complete breakdown of society. When they break out of that, they break out with a vengeance that we will never, ever again be in this situation. That breakout comes in the 1400s with the Portuguese. And they, 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 they will wreak vengeance on the rest of the world to control trade routes, economic territories. Where is the wheat grown? Where is the gold? Where is the barley? We will get control of these things because we will never be caught in the dark ages again. In Cuba, they have a Spanish dish. It's called Moros y Cristianos, which means Moors and Christians. And this dish consists of white rice, which is the white Christians, and black beans, which represents the black Moors. So this theme of a racial battle disguised as a religious battle, that's still in popular culture today. When you conquer a civilization, you're actually conquering their God. Because what do you do? You change the name of God once you change their religion, once you change their culture. So the name of God is based upon how you create God. In other words, my perception of God now rules. It's initially about greed, but it's about greed coming from a, a culture. European culture has always been a war culture. Going back as far as you can go back to the, the father's Germanic tribe, to the Vikings, the culture has been based on dominance, destruction, and death. And if you can carry that out against another people, you were the victim. There was no, they did not have a religious concept where the, the value of human lives was significant. 
in the way Africa and Asia put human life first and dominance second. The oldest human beings on this planet came from Africa. And as these Africans migrated out of Africa and traveled northward, uh, they were trapped behind a wall of ice during the Wormian Ice Age 40,000 years ago. And through the process of speciation, they lost their melanin, became so-called European or, or Caucasian. But the other thing that's not often talked about is in losing the melanin, they also lost this quality that we refer to as the soul, this substance that civilizes you. Uh, helps you to see your fellow human being as a fellow human being. So now with the absence of the civilizing molecule, the civilizing substance, if you will, they saw people as objects, objects to be found, discovered, controlled, manipulated, and wiped out if necessary in order to ensure your survival. So that is the driving force, and that's the major difference between the two groups of people. Millie Fuller came up with a book called The Compensatory Code Concept, which he introduced the idea of white supremacy being a religion. And by saying that white supremacy is a religion, that means that it's a belief that's backed up by power, that's backed up by action. And that action and power negatively affects people who are of melanated descent. The relationship between black and white Americans, um, it's almost like an abusive marriage uh, where er each partner needs the other one. I mean, you know, a, a husband that beats his wife, sometimes he may love his wife. He don't want her to leave. He wants her to stay in the relationship and keep getting beat. You know, And, and she may also be codependent as well and, and really, really love her husband, be more loyal than a woman who's being treated well down the street. Why? Because she knows, uh, in her mind, she knows her place. And her place is... Uh, it is not one of, 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 of dominance, it's one of subjugation. The genetic signature and the mind of the genetics has the will to continue. And that it becomes strongest when puberty hits. The will to, uh, to continue to procreate becomes so strong that you would kill for it. So the genetics of a man who in his mind fears the death of that thing that makes him unique, he will become as vicious as necessary to save and preserve that. Well, Sheikh Anta Diop uh, teaches us about the, the sun people and the ice people. Uh, so what gave them the momentum is psychological disposition that came out of that ice age. So for sun people, African people, um, African people, what was their psychological disposition? living in the warmth, very little clothing, could just go outside and pick a fruit, as Dr. Ben would say, because there was this abundance. Whereas for ice people living in the caves uh, and hills through the ice age, developing that disposition, the first thing they had to go out and do is kill. Imagine if a group of battle-hardened soldiers from Vietnam who've been in, in Nam for 10 years, you know, uh, walked into a, a church where everybody's loving and hugging and being peaceful, um, who's gonna win that battle? You know, uh, who, who's, gonna, who's gonna eventually dominate that church? The soldiers are, because they're gonna come with weapons, they're ready to fight, uh, they've gone through hell, uh, they've got battle tactics in hand. Um, you know, the people in the church may not even know they're in a war. That's what I see when I, when I look at Europeans versus the rest of the world. Europeans have treated the world horrifically. We know that, uh, what they've done in, in, in Africa, in South America, North America, etc. But if you keep going further back, you look at how they treated each other. It's, it's astonishing. I mean, they basically had about a thousand years of complete ignorance, savagery, uh, self-destruction, community destruction. We also got to be very clear about the terms we use, because when I use the term white supremacy or white supremacist, that's not to say that all white people are racist or all white people are white supremacists. That's incorrect. But the people who do choose to practice white supremacy are more powerful than the ones who are not. And a white supremacist is someone who believes through speech, thought, or action that they should be in a superior position over people who are non-white. When you're constantly at war, you, 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 your, your battle tactics is gonna be stronger. You're gonna have more weapons and more advanced weapons. So they then take this, uh, this ideology 
as well as this weaponry, as well as this skill set into the world, and they go to places where resources are plentiful, so you're not fighting for territory necessarily in Africa or in North America. Native Americans really were not big on the idea of even trying to own land. Like, no, the land is here. The, the land's for everybody. The buffalo, there's plenty of buffalo. Just kill what you need, you know, right? So you've got people kind of with this mindset that's not prepared for this sort of, um, you know, savage, uh, the battle-hardened mentality. So. Uh, it's really easy prey for, for the Europeans. Well, as it relates to uh, domination on a physical level, as it relates to torture, murder, mayhem, as it pertains to a society that has no order and arrangement, then they would have some form, if you look at the word dominance, they would have the word dominance. The question is, as it relates to honor, integrity, and dignity, is that the type of dominance that you want? If you want to create the type of society that inbred is about to implode on itself because of the nature of the conditions you've put on people, then you would have to use the word dominant. And I would use the word dominant. But if you're looking for the society that I believe is balanced within the forces of nature, then they are not dominant. In fact, they are inferior to the fact because eventually nature is going to take back what they attempted to steal. You cannot cancel the future. You can only postpone it. One thing that the white supremacists learn how to do is pretend to practice certain religions that other melanated people practiced all around the world, but their real religion is white supremacy when you peel the layers back. Because when you look at all of the religions, all of them are dominated by white supremacy now. So what's the real religion? The real religion is white supremacy. Through this religion of white supremacy, the closer you are in, in complexion to this ruling entity, then the higher you are up in the pyramid. And so when Europeans left Europe and came to America, they had an opportunity now to be higher up on that pyramid. And so once they got here, a poor man in Europe, a poor Irishman, the Irishman, Irishman were looked upon by Europeans as the niggas of Europe. But they can come to America and they can amass power, wealth, and respectability. As a matter of fact, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and those guys, they wouldn't have made it in Europe, but they can come here and adapt that same uh, mentality and then open the door for other poor Europeans to come here and benefit from whiteness. So the Rahoa is a term that means racial holy war. It was popularized by a white extremist named Ben Classen. Now also Ben Classen, he wrote a book called The White Man's Bible, where he goes into great detail about how to eliminate the so-called mud people, meaning black people. So these white supremacists, they have all types of doctrines and code words and books and paraphernalia and um, information out here on how to subjugate black people and non-white people around the planet. Christianity that is being reintroduced to Africa is worthless to Africa. The Islam that is being introduced to Africa and used still as a form of slavery in Eastern Africa is worthless to Africa. Africa created all of the world's religions, from agnostic to Zoroastrianism, came out of the mind of Africa. So the idea of the missionary, and this is the piece that we always have to look at, because when they first came to Africa, those of Eurasian descent, they did not come physically. They came spiritually. And when they came spiritually and they got the indigenous peoples to embrace their faith system, then came the teachers that then indoctrinated them from an educational perspective. And after they had your mind and after they had your spirit, the physicalness was only a mop-up operation. Throughout history, people who have been captured have always been allowed to convert to the religion of their captors. But black people have not been allowed to do that. Black people have been trying to do that for the last 500 years. Black people have been trying to convert to what they think is the religion of the oppressor, is, which is Christianity. But that's not the religion of the oppressor. The religion is white supremacy, because if it was Christianity, the churches that we see today would not be the most segregated places in the planet. Church is the most segregated place in the world. You have black churches and you have white churches. If you're a Christian, there should not be a black church and a white church. There should just be a church. So if we have white churches and black churches, the reason why we have a black church is because we have a white church and we have a white church because we have white supremacy. So white supremacy must be the real religion. 
1822, when Champollion deciphered hieroglyphics, it made it possible for the first time in about 1,300 years that people could now go into Kemet and read the writings, the Medunetra, on the, on the temples and on the papyri. And once they began to read that writing, they began to understand that everything that they had been teaching Christianity is a lie and based on African concepts that had been created thousands of years earlier. In the Bible, they have a Genesis story. And the Genesis story said in the beginning, God was the Word and the Word was God and God created the water and the land and the darkness and the light and the human and etc. Well, that story almost paralleled the story in the coffin text and the Book of the Coming Forth by Day, which we call the Book of the Dead. They also have a Genesis story almost word for word, like the Christian Genesis story. So actually, when you look at Christianity, it is a warmed over version of Kemetic theocracy. One example is a book called um, the Book of Amenemope, which is an instruction text written by the ancient Egyptians. And that instruction text was copied word for word as Proverbs 22 and 23. 14 words, that's a doctrine and that's a slogan by white extremists all around the world. That means we must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children. And this is a slogan that they use and it's a code that they use. So whenever you see white extremist groups who have the number 14 tattooed on their arm or anywhere on their bodies, that's what they're referencing. They're referencing this code 14 along with the number 88. The 88, that's a, a number that represents the letter H because H is the eighth letter of the alphabet and the H, H means Hell Hitler. So these are little code words that the white supremacists send to each other. The Bible itself, when you look at the word, comes from the word Biblos. And Biblos was the capital of what we call Phoenicia, which today is Lebanon. And when the Greeks went to rewrite the books of their teachers, the, the African peoples of Kemet, they went to Biblos to get their paper to write and rewrite the books. And when they did that, the name of the book became the place where they got their paper to buy the book. Our religion comes at the end of a sword or at the end of swords, where everybody's been decimated and brutally annihilated. You know, and after that type of brutality, you'll accept anything. And your conqueror can tell you your gods don't exist because look at you, you're dead and in the street. Once that Catholic church breaks away, the church moves into the dominance when we see Constantine arise as an arm of a military government. So the, the Catholic Church then becomes the rationale, the theological rationale for imperialism and dominance. If you look at a cathedral, a Catholic cathedral, if you're looking at it properly, you know you're looking at a fortress. They have towers at the end, and at the top they have this bell to warn the sentries, this warning when attack is coming. It is nothing but a fort. But to us, a Catholic cathedral is a church, but it is a military fort. That's why they have the tower up there for the sentry to ring it when they're coming for the attack. That's why they ring the bell. One tool of the white supremacists is to use what I call the three M's. The first M is the missionaries. The missionaries go in there first, and they con people. They go in there and act like they're part of some type of religious organization and they appeal to the spirituality of melanoid people. And the second thing they do is bring in the merchant class. After the missionaries come in, they say, we need to bring in our products, we need to bring in our people to sell things and to use some of the resources here. And then the third thing they bring in are the military. They bring the military in to then subjugate and take over the land and decimate the people for centuries to come. If you have anything, it has to be bipolar. If you have a church, you better have a military. If you have a store, you better have a military. You can call it security if you want. Everything comes with the male principle. And we have a church, but no military. See, when you build that church, you gotta have a military. You should build a military and a church at the same time. It has to be bipolar. Religion's always the tool that's used. It's being used right now. You know, that's, the, that's one of the main strategies used to conquer a people is to destroy their religion, quest, make them question their own spirituality, destroy the cultural artifacts that go along with it. That's the way, there's a, there's a book called The Grand Chessboard. 
by Brzezinski, who, who once was, um, he was the foreign policy advisor to Jimmy Carter. And what he told him was, if you want to take over a people, you destroy their culture and you destroy their religion and you destroy the artifacts that they create. As the world expands, meaning our, our involvement in the rest of the world by Europe, sees that the world of color makes up three quarters of the planet. So you need some troops. So the white skin, non-whites, you're gonna attach them to you. So you're gonna make them honorary Caucasians. So now Jews are honorary Caucasians. Uh, Irish are honorary Caucasians. Italians are honorary Caucasians. Eastern Europeans are now honorary Caucasians. That means you're not honorary Germanics. White supremacy, again, is a religion, and other races of people are converted into that religion because people can't really define what a white person is genetically. See, it gets real tricky when you try to talk about what is whiteness from a genetic standpoint because certain people who are white today were not white 50, 60 years ago. The Irish were not white during the 1800s. They became white. They were allowed to be white later on. Many Italians and Greek people, they were not considered white until later on. Jewish people, many of them were not considered white till later on. So what happens is the white supremacists, when they feel that numbers are dwindling, they allow other groups to convert into whiteness. And in order to convert, they make it their duty to take on the mindset where they want to mistreat and subjugate people who are non-white. Magazine has these cool pieces, and they did a piece where you rent a white person in China. You rent a white person. So there's a former New York City police officer, does know deeply about duty, gets up, gives a speech at a medical conference to, to Asian people who really are doctors. But because he's white and because he speaks proper English, meaning white English, he's always going to have a job. After the 1960s, after 1965 in particular, when black people were fighting for civil rights, the white supremacists wanted to create a backlash against that, so they allowed different immigrant groups to come over to the United States with the Immigration Act of 1965. And one group that they allowed to be the model minority were Asians. We started to see an influx of Asian, Korean, all types of people come in, and then the white supremacists started to hold the Koreans and Asian groups up and saying, hey, look at these people. They just got here. They're doing better than those black folks. It was somewhat of a way to shame the black population by holding up the Asian population and looking at them and pretending that they were the model minority when just years before, Asian people were mocked and subjugated just like other groups. If you look at media back before the 1960s or before the 1970s, they would portray Asian people with with, with glasses and buck teeth and with the Fu Manchu walking around being silly and goofy. If you come from anywhere in North Africa, don't care how black you are, you are Caucasian. Until the 1970s, if you came from Trinidad, you were Caucasian. I remember when I first saw that, an ironic, beautiful lady, I'm working in, I get out of the military, I get a job at the post office, I'm doing mail across from this magnificently beautiful sister. So I'm trying to, you know, brother trying to make a play. She told me, she don't deal with black folks. She don't speak to black people. So I'm like, girl, what's wrong with you? She says, I'm Caucasian. And she left the job, went home on lunch, got her passport and brought it back to me. In the passport, it said this black woman was a Caucasian. And so the psychology of white supremacy that used dominance and terror and fear, psychological fear, spiritual fear, physical fear and tyranny to make people become addicted to wanting to identify with them just to feel safe. One way the white supremacists have been able to dominate and subjugate melanated people around the planet is by controlling the education, by controlling the knowledge, and controlling the knowledge of history. Because if you don't know yourself, you don't know how to empower yourself. If you don't know your history, you won't know your future. And the white supremacists have been very meticulous in erasing the history of African people and inserting themselves into that history. The Greeks were the last race of people that the Egyptians passed the arcane knowledge onto. That's where this Greek to me came from. 
They were the last ones that the Egyptians gave that to. It took three generations of Greeks under Egyptian rulership that they could finally find one that they could teach. Now the Egyptians call their land Kemet, and they use a piece of charcoal, a burnt piece of wood as charcoal, to symbolize what they mean, the blackest black. And all of their carvings of themselves, they paint their skins dark brown or black. They have white paint, red paint, yellow paint, but they paint themselves black. How anyone in the world with so much information available for the public to see, can even be under any illusions that the Egyptian is even light-skinned. Just when you look at climate and weather, if you go to Egypt, you will notice that the weather is quite hot. And you will notice that it is almost impossible to be able to be outside dressed the way the carvings on the walls are as it relates to the people because you would get melanoma before we even knew melanoma existed. So they could not have been uh, depigmented or less pigmented. They have to have been heavily pigmented. So what we have then is various eyewitness descriptions where people visited Egypt and they left an account of the Egyptians in their texts. So what you have is people like Herodotus who describes them as black-skinned and woolly-haired. Galen who describes them as having short, black, dry, and brittle hair. Not to mention, as Dr. Clark has taught us, where in the world did they do what they did in Africa? He used to say, are you telling me that Eurasians came out of Europe and built Africa up, but never went back to Europe to develop their civilizations the way, the way they did in Africa? Or does it make sense that it was built up in Africa and it was sporadically brought across the globe to China? and to Iraq, and to uh, Iran, and into Europe, uh, where you have the Stonehenge. Would that make better sense? So the answer is, there is no question at this point. Many of the artifacts that are on display in many of the Egyptian collections around the world are fakes. The Nefertiti statue is of doubtful authenticity. That's a posh way of saying it's almost certainly a fake. A number of scholars have come out quite recently. Henri Sterling in um, Switzerland, he's come out and said, listen, this is a 100-year forgery. If there is hundreds of paintings of Nefertiti and all of them are black, all of the statues in the Cairo Museum of Nefertiti is black, only this one little white statue in Germany is white. Something's wrong with that picture. Marx was instructed to use the face of Lud uh, Ludwig's wife, Emily Bouchard. So the face that supposedly was the most beautiful face of ancient history is actually the features of uh, Ludwig Bouchard's wife, Emily Bouchard. So now, that's not even the half of it. Hmm, beautiful statue came out of the ground. Mm, no, it didn't come out of the ground. What happened was he, Brochard, was forced to bring it forward after 11 years. So what did he do? He took the head that Marx made, went back to the Tel Alamar site, covered it up with dirt, and came out and had a photo op as if that's how he found it. One common lie and misconception that many white supremacists likes to, like to promote is that the African people didn't invent the wheel that African people were just primitive, living in West Africa, waiting on the white supremacists to come save them. But in Africa, especially in the area that we now know as Southern Libya, right in the Saharan Desert, there were rock paintings of black Africans on chariots, and you can see the wheel, and these paintings go back 7,000 years. In 951 AD, there was a scholar called Ibn Haukal, and he wrote a book. And in his book, he describes two things. The first is visiting a fringe city of ancient Ghana called Aldegast. And he witnessed a merchant writing another merchant a check for 42,000 golden dinars. 
Now that should blow people's heads clean off. West Africa had checks 951 AD. The second thing he describes is that the emperor of Ghana was the richest king on the face of the earth. There is a city known as Eredo, E-R-E-D-O, that's located in Nigeria that uh, the brilliant scholar Robin Walker is coming out with information dealing with the idea that this in Nigeria is a city that is 400 square miles in elliptical shape and the ramparts or the gates are 70 feet high or, or what, what might be considered to be maybe a seven-story building. That's how big it is. And that was done somewhere in the 800s to 1000 AD. At the same time, 400 years later in the 1400s and the 1500s, we're focused saying these people are primitive. This city exists in Nigeria. Once Britain burned the palace and they colonized the region and then renamed it Nigeria, it wasn't called that before, they did not permit the Oba, that's the emperor of Benin, to rebuild the palace. So consequently, what's there now is the tiny fraction that escaped being burned down. We look at cities that were larger than cities in Europe at that time. We look at cities that had the equivalent of ancient skyscrapers, buildings that were uh, four or five stories tall. We look at cities with streets. We look at cities with sewer systems. We look at uh, cities, uh, nations that had universities, that had libraries, that had a upper class, a solid middle class, architects, engineers, physicians, dentists, uh, a city that would rival any other city in the world at that time. Well, the emperor of Ghana, we know, lived in a castle with glass windows. We know this because there's an 1153 AD document that tells us that there were glass windows. We've got uh, Keno uh, in parts of Nigeria. We've got the great Chad Basin civilizations. We got civilizations along the Congo that we don't even talk about. And what, what's ironic, in the 1700s, and you can actually go online and find some of them, the Europeans who go to the Congo come back home and draw pictures, which is in their museums, of these magnificent metropolis, these cities with streets laid out in grids and paved. They found the same thing in Benin, they found the same thing in Kamasi. But these same Europeans, especially the British and the French, will burn and sack most of these cities. A Polish scholar called Z.R. Dmitrovsky did a survey of Nigerian ancient monuments and wrote three volume architectural book called An Introduction to Traditional Nigerian Architecture, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. Now, that's important, you see, because most people wouldn't have thought that Nigeria had anything to be able to fill three volumes. Which brings me on to Benin. Benin is in the southern part of Nigeria. Now, Benin's architecture was very famous in medieval times. In particular, its royal palace. Its royal palace was the same size as whole European cities. Just the palace. Ethiopia was one of the earliest countries to embrace Christianity, right? And so uh, what you have in Ethiopia is, is a ancient civilization. You know, Ethiopia, we gotta remember, Ethiopia is the source of the Blue Nile, right? And based on research that I'm looking at now, I'm really beginning to realize that Kemet is Ethiopia's oldest daughter. So the knowledge that flowered in Kemet began first in Ethiopia. They never occupied and, and dominated and conquered Ethiopia totally. And that's because King Menelik understood he needed more than just spirituality because a lot of the Africans in other parts of Africa, they depended on their spiritual system. But when you're dealing with a group of people like the white supremacists who were not spiritual at all, you're going to lose. So King Menelik, he used his spirituality, but he understood that he had to be practical. So King Menelik, he got guns that rivaled the guns of his enemies. 
And when the Italians came into Ethiopia to try to defeat him, King Menelik used his guns and used his weaponry to fight them off. What Ethiopia was able to achieve was nothing short of military genius. Um, they struggled uh, certainly with Italy for maintaining their, their independence. But I think what, what they were able to do was to use the, the land to their advantage. They were able to strategize and they really outthought the enemy. And they were underestimated, let's face it. I think they were under, their military power was underestimated. And so when you had all of this in the psyche of a people, this notion of, of empire and, and kingdoms and defending ourselves against the Greek army, the Roman army, the Turkish army, the Persian armies, plus some little rinky-dink Italians. We can handle this, and they handled it. And when King Menelik in Ethiopia defeated the Italians, what's interesting, the Western media started to portray King Menelik as a white man. So this man was a, a, clearly a black African brother. There was pictures of him in the whole nine, but the Western media started to show cartoons and images of him as being white because they didn't want to let the world see that the European had been defeated by this African man. Traditional African religions, particularly the one from ancient Egypt and Sudan, venerated this idea called ma'at. And ma'at, roughly speaking, you could translate it as truth, as justice, as righteousness, as reciprocity. The problem is, is when you're being attacked by people who don't believe any of that, and you are trying to do the ma'atic thing, they will beat you, unfortunately. And this is one of those harsh lessons that the black community is still to learn. The assumption that another group's view of humanity is the same as ours. The assumption that another group's understanding of divinity is the same as ours. The African moved from the premise that everybody was a brother and thus should be treated and accorded that kind of brothership and brotherhood. The European moved from a position that what is mine is mine and what is yours is mine if I can take it. You had a war culture coming in contact with an agrarian culture. The war culture is always going to win because the war culture doesn't put any value on human life. And that means it has no barometer to how much death and destruction it will carry out. People talk about the greatness of Africa, and we, we see some of the great empires that we had over in Africa. And naturally, a lot of people will say, okay, if we had all these great empires, where did Africa go wrong? There's several situations that, that happened. One thing that happened with Africa, you had Mansa Musa. Now, Mansa Musa, according to most historians, West African black man who was a king in, in the area that we know as Mali and Timbuktu, the wealthiest man to ever live. And... Mansa Musa's situation was a gift and a curse because Mansa Musa, he went around the world basically just giving out gold. This man had so much money, he could give money away. And he gave so much money out, it, it decimated certain economies and other nations. So it showed the humanity of the African people and the generosity of the African people. But you showed people that you had all of this wealth, so now people are plotting on you. So when people saw Mansa Musa giving out all that money, he became lunch to everybody else. So Africa started to get raided and flooded with all types of people trying to take advantage of the wealth and the resources that were in Africa. The tide rises and falls. I mean, what are we talking about? We're not, we're not supposed to be a victim of time. When you're going into Africa, you're going into Africa when it was falling, when it was old and worn out, trying to nurture and educate the East Indians, the Chinese, and the Europeans. We were trying to help all of these people to raise them up to a higher level, and they wore us out. Even today, you'll get worn out if you talk to a certified Negro under warranty. They will wear you out. We didn't take military matters seriously. We didn't take warfare seriously. And I'm aware that the propaganda where the West presents, such as the Zulus, as a highly militaristic nation. Unfortunately, we needed a lot more Zulus and a lot more people on that militaristic thing because historically that's where we were weak. I don't know why Nubia failed. Besides, all nations fall. Rome fell, Greece fell, the current empires you're in are going to fall and new superpowers are going to come. 
So yeah, we failed. Kings died. Other people mishandled money. The same thing that happened with your grandma inheritance after she died. The same thing. Some of your cousins went and wilded out with it. The other your cousins took it and created their own little things. The same thing happened. But the question is, how do we create in Israel? How do we create in India? How do we create a Germany? How do we create something for us? Because we need something. You know, Dr. John Henry Clark was like, we, we're yelling that we want a nation and it's nation time. And we don't even know how to build a train. The Japanese bought one train, reverse engineered that train. Now they're selling trains. Any nation fails is you don't want it to fall again. So ultimately, if I, if I wanted to find out why any black nation failed, I would, I would go to the most recent one because the most recent one works by our recent standards of governing and governance, and that would be Haiti. Why did Haiti fail? Haiti was, was sabotaged by France. Haiti was looted, and she was sanctioned globally. Haiti offered any blacks anywhere in the hemisphere, from the Dominican Republic, the United States, if you can escape from slavery and get here, you're a free man, and we protect the integrity of your freedom. That is what the anger against Haiti was about. Haiti was the first free republic that offered freedom to any enslaved people, black or white, from anywhere. If you make it to these lands, our army will protect your integrity. For 444 years of the European enslavement of African people, you had the best and the brightest of African people steadily taken out. And then after that genocide, after that Holocaust, Europeans decided that they were going to go in now after the Berlin Conference and control the land for another 88 years. So Africa has only been free for less than 50 years, but it's still suffering from the ravages of 444 years of slavery, 88 years of colonization. You don't recover from that automatically unless there are plans in place to aid your recovery. After Europe was destroyed during World War I and World War II, you had the Marshall Plan and other plans that were implemented by the United States in order to rebuild Europe. Look at photographs of, of London, photographs of, of, of Paris after the war, after the bombing and then see what American aid did 20 years later to rebuild those cities. So we think that Europe has always looked like that. No, Europe, Europe has had more wars in Africa, it's said, but, they now, but they've had access to resources to rebuild. Africa hasn't had the ability to, to rebuild. There was no revolution there. There was no independence granted. All they were doing, done was to make a few Negroes wealthy and then uh, y'all manage the apartheid poverty for us. But we'll keep all of our banks, we'll keep all of our mines, we'll keep all of our industry. We're not sharing nothing with you. We'll keep the best 80% of the farmland and you can't even come into our little towns. There are towns in South Africa we don't know the names of. That's the most prosperous, most beautiful places in the world. White folks are retiring from Europe every day. The, especially the aristocrats going there to live. And they make us think South Africa is Johannesburg. Colonial powers of Europe left African nations. They took everything, even the light bulbs. They ripped up the train tracks. They said, if we're leaving, we're going to make sure that you won't be able to sustain yourself. And they destroyed everything. It's, it's no different than what happened in America after emancipation. When they left, they destroyed all. Oh, Guinea is one of the classic cases. They even took the toilet paper. They took everything out of Guinea. And then, and from the international marketplace, fought to keep Guinea from ever developing international trade with Europe. Guinea has the largest supply of iron ore in the world. Who do you think control and own it? Some Israeli mega capitalists. You know, your zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Those numbers that we have are, people call them Arabic numerals. They're not Arabic, they're Hindu. But the mathematicians that introduced me to Europe were, in fact, uh, African mathematicians. The fraction bar, where you've got, you know, two fraction seven and the fraction bar, that was something that was invented by an African uh, mathematician. Some of the most advanced math textbooks during the period were again written by Moorish mathematicians. Where it comes to the areas of astronomy, where it comes to um, areas such as navigation, uh, map making and so on, 
So there was a Moorish geographer called El Idrisi, and he was the one that said in his book that the world is as round as a sphere, and the waters are held to it by what he calls natural equilibrium. You can work out what he really means, gravity. And he says that the world is divided into 360 degrees. Now this was 1153. And then that gives you some idea of what kind of intellect we're talking about. Guinea was the French word, the European word for West Africa. So in all of Africa, at some point was called Guinea. And so when they get in the Pacific, they see all the black folks, so they say, okay, this is the new Guinea. That's why it's called New Guinea. You got New Caledonia. You got uh, Vanuatu. You had Australia. These are all African populations. Easter Island is off of the coast of South America going into the Pacifics. And all of the statues there are statues of African images. The statues in Easter Island, they look identical to ancient face masks that's from West Africa. Also in Easter Island, there's an ancient script called Rongo Rongo. And this writing looks identical to African hieroglyphics. Also, there's an East African tribe called the Rongo tribe. Also, there's another very remote Pacific island called Nukuhiva. Now, this place is in the middle of nowhere, but there are statues on this island that look identical to ancient statues that are in Nigeria. So we definitely have evidence of an African presence in some of the most remote places around the globe. You know, the Mammy uh, Monument <laughs> uh, came on the heels of the creation of the Lincoln Memorial. Lincoln Memorial was built in uh, 1922, right? So uh, it was a memorial in honor of the 16th president, the first president of the United States to be assassinated. Abraham Lincoln, the man who uh, brought on the Civil War, the man who uh, was responsible for uh, ending slavery, and he was assassinated for that. So a decision was made to build this memorial to honor Abraham Lincoln. And as a result, the backlash from uh, Southern politicians was to now find a way to undo all of the celebration regarding making Abraham Lincoln a hero. And that idea was to create a Mammy monument to honor those blacks who submitted to slavery in order to present a counterpoint to Abraham Lincoln. What stopped that whole Mammy movement, because they weren't just talking about putting the statue up in Washington, they were trying to put the statues up all across the South in every major capital in the South. They wanted one of these types of statue, and, and the, with this rationale, but it was the black newspaper and the black community that rose up, and the NACP that, that then got with the liberals in government to crush that movement, because they were serious about doing this. When we think about the concept of aviation, we think about the Wright brothers, and then if we go back, we think of people like Da Vinci, who had drawings about flight, and a lot of people try to say that Da Vinci's drawings were the first ones that talked about people flying. But there was a moor in Spain in around the year 875, at the height of the Moorish conquest of Spain. And Ibn Fernaz was one of the first people to test out flight and navigation. At the Iraqi airport, there's a, a statue of Ibn Farnas that's paying homage to his knowledge of, of aviation and flight. Mike Hollis, who I interviewed years ago with Air Atlanta, I mean, he was a young brother. I mean, he was barely in his 40s, you know, late 30s, early 40s, and saw a need, got the investment dollars, and launched, um, you know, Air Atlanta. But you had Piedmont Airs. Piedmont Airlines, which was out of, uh, you know, North Carolina, uh, Southern Virginia area, Tennessee area, and which uh, a group of black investors were about to make a play on it. So um, this whole aviation sector is, isn't new to us. I mean, there, there's so much opportunity out there. Air Atlanta was an airline that was owned by a black man down in Atlanta. Very high class airline. This airline, they had it for a couple of years in the 80s, and the airline had all first class seats. They would serve on fine China. So this was a top notch airline that a lot of folks don't know about that was owned by black men.
Renee Lacoste is the designer of the Lacoste shirts that we see now today. That's still a very high-end clothing line that we see in high-end stores all around the world. Now, a lot of people don't know that Renee Lacoste was a black man who lived in France, and he was a tennis player. Um, they called him the alligator because he would just decimate his opponents. And his father was white, but his mother was black Jamaican sister. And they kept that quiet. They still kind of keep that quiet to this day. You don't hear too much about his mother. But Lacoste is a black man. And a lot of folks don't know when you wear the Lacoste clothes, you're wearing the clothes of a brother who designed that. One thing, the white supremacists, they try to make it seem like racism is just a Southern thing. They're very good at telling that lie. But when you look around the country, Certain places were not just segregated. Black people were just not allowed. For example, out in the West, Oregon, black people were not even allowed to live in Oregon until the 1920s. Black people couldn't come there at all. It wasn't no segregation. You just weren't supposed to be there. People in England did not start shampooing until the late 1700s. And the reason they started to shampoo is a brother named Sheikh Dean Muhammad, who's a melanoid brother out of India who went into Europe. He introduced shampoo to Europe. You know, I go to Europe a lot, and I perform there. And one of the most interesting things to me is when I go there, the same way when you're here and you walk around in America in airports, you see travel agencies telling you you should go to Mexico, you should go to South America, you should go to the Caribbean. They advertise everywhere they conquer in the Western Hemisphere. When you go to Europe, they tell you you should go to Africa, and they show you these islands. And I'm sitting there as a black man like, damn. Like, they never tell us to go to Africa, but... They conquered it, and they conquered it so solely that it's a resort to them. statement that Count Volney made in his book, Ruins of Empire, is very interesting, where in paraphrasing it, he's saying, you know, the very people we are now enslaving in the Caribbean and in Africa are the very creators of this society and this great civilization that we are emulating and attempting to bring back into Europe. Because when you look at um, the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower is, a, is an obelisk or a tekanu placed upon a myrrh or a pyramid except it's only skeletal. When you look at the Arc du Triomphe in France, that is in every temple that you go to in Kemet. So that they were actually stealing ideas from people that they were attempting to enslave North Sentinel Island, that's an island that's right in the Bay of Bengal. That's right between India and Asia, right off the coast of Thailand. And this island, the people have been there for over 60,000 years. Now these are jet black people. These are deep, deep melanated people. And these black people, they've been on this island for years, and they are the only people on the planet that have never been subjugated by the white supremacists. And the reason why they've never been subjugated by the white supremacists is because they got one code. The minute you step on North Sentinel Island, they will kill you on sight. They will slit your throat, no questions asked. Well, they're primitive, they're backwards people, they're Stone Age people, but one thing they can say is that they are not dominated by the white supremacists. So to me, that makes them some of the smartest black people on the planet. One part of the religion of white supremacy is to sacrifice certain people and sacrifice their lives for the sake of your religion, to show your dominance in your religion. And this is what the white supremacists, they do with, with melanoid people all around the world. We are this beast that they are afraid of and they have to destroy in order to protect themselves, protect their women, by extension, protect their country. So the more white folk in America become a minority, the more afraid they're going to be, the more reactionary they're going to be, and the more they're going to see a need to circle the culture wagons and take us out. This is their last dance. And to be perfectly honest with you, if you really understand the essence of white supremacy, they have to do that. In their minds, they have to do that because to submit is to die. So they are like a caged animal or animal that's been trapped in a corner. They're going to do everything within their power to survive. And if we understand that and understand this is the mentality that we're dealing with, then our reaction has to be a different reaction. You know, we can't react to everything that they do if we understand their mindset. We have to know how not to provoke them. But there are other things that we could be doing and should be doing in order to maximize our presence right, and take back our power. 
so that we neutralize them just by our very presence. In order to maintain a system of supremacy, you have to also maintain that people stay in a position. And if they get too far ahead or uh, uh, make too many for advances, there's a fear that we're going to lose control. I've even had people say to me, well, if we give, uh, in quotes, black people everything they're asking for, then, then we will be out of control. During the Jim Crow era, and this just goes to show how sick the white supremacists are, because black people, we, we don't understand that they will harm our children just like they'll harm us. And they would have something called the Battle Royale where they would go get black children who were in an economically deprived situation that was created by the white supremacists because remember they create economic deprivation so they get these people who are economically deprived and then they offer them scraps in order to be to entertain themselves so they would get these black children and take them to these boxing matches that you had a lot of white supremacists watching and paying to see and watch these kids beat each other up but it blindfold young black males and it could be any amount of them from three, four, to five to ten, and they put in a ring or a circle, and they have to fight until the last man standing. So they just beat each other nearly to death, hoping to get whatever little rewards or favor that will come at the end of the day with who was left standing. And that was called the Battle Royal. Jack Johnson came out of that process of the Battle Royal, our great black heavyweight, first black heavyweight champion of the world came out of that process uh, down in Galveston, Texas, where he grew up. And that was all through the South as an entertainment mode for white folks to watch black young kids beat themselves into a frenzy while blindfolded with the hope that they won't get hurt at the end of the day, killed at the end of the day, or might get some pittance of a reward that they could take home and help their families. When we look at circus clowns, especially the hobo clown, the sad face clown with the ripped up clothes, that came from the white supremacists making fun of black people. At around 1874, there were these two white men who were minstrel show artists, McIntyre and Heath. And in 1874, you remember this is directly after the Civil War. When the Civil War was over, a lot of black people were homeless and destitute and they would have to ride boxcars and trains all around the country looking for work and they would wear tattered clothes and they were just poor begging and just trying to do whatever they needed to do to survive and living in a culture of white supremacy the white supremacists looked at that and said okay that's something that we could make fun of so these two white minstrel show entertainers they started to dress up in tattered clothes and paint their faces black and they had these big white exaggerated lips with a sad look on it because black people were sad at that time after the civil war because they were destitute and they made a mockery of this and went around the world and went around the country doing these minstrel shows and eventually that image went into the circuses, where circus clowns started to do that. And even to this day, you still have these circus clowns with the dark faces and the big white exaggerated lips and the tattered clothes and the, the holes in the shoes. And that hobo clown image that we see today in circuses all around the world is basically still mocking black people. There's a pride that comes when you've trained the animal, the same way you train a big elephant, and you take him to the circus and you, you, you make the elephant do little tricks and because because you control the elephant's mind since birth you've 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 intimidated the elephant to the point where he thinks that you're actually the superior one in this relationship when really he could crush you with one foot uh, we, and that starts at a very early age you start by shocking him every time he gets out of line you reward him when he be, when he behaves properly that's exactly what they do to young black men they they are uh, training us like circus animals from a very early age so that later on there, there is this this pride in in showing off the trained animal like look at how how that nigga can jump look at how fast that nigga can run right but when the the animal gets out of line when the elephant decides he step wants to kill the trainer or or he just starts to lose it for whatever reason what do they do they kill him they they, they take they take him out there's another game that the white supremacists used to play at carnivals called the African Dodger, where they would get a black person and have him stick his head in a hole and they would throw baseballs at him 
and try to see who can hit him in the head. And this was entertainment to the white supremacists. Anything that will harm black people has always been entertainment to the white supremacists. This is why lynching was entertainment to the white supremacists. Even to this day, seeing black children get murdered in the streets by the white supremacists with impunity, that's entertainment. This is why these people who do it, they get paid, they get big donation money to harm black people. Black people who are getting into, you know, the jihadism and all kinds of foolishness where you end up fighting other people's battles, fighting other people's issues and not actually trying to stand together as black people is really, really embarrassing. It's almost for black people, when we analyze our existence, we're seeing ourselves in our pain, but we don't dare mention the fact that white people are causing this pain and we don't dare mention the idea that we're going to retaliate against those who are causing the pain. We're just going to endure the pain because that's our place. Our place is to struggle and to just survive it. Uh, we get through it with prayer, um, you know, and, and we get our maybe we get our blessing in the afterlife. Uh, and every time someone commits another atrocity against our people, we have individuals again, you know, provided by you know, sponsored by white supremacy to remind us of the importance of being passive and nonviolent. There were a lot of black people who were talking about taking up arms and defending themselves. There was something called the Battle of Hayes Pond that a lot of people don't know about where black people fought against the Klan and they took up arms against them. So black people were not just taking all these beatings laying down. There were a lot of black people who were fighting back physically against systematic white supremacy. Just outside of Selma, Alabama, there was a group of black folk who protected the civil rights movement. There was a group of black folk who protected King uh, as they marched from Selma to Montgomery. And these were brothers who called themselves the Black Panthers. They had guns, and they made sure that nothing happened to some of their brothers. The deacons had formed to protect civil rights marchers. See, it wasn't just like we got some guns back here. They were actually making sure that if you're going to shoot at these marchers, somebody's going to shoot back at you. And there were other groups like RAMS, the Revolutionary Action Movement, uh, the International Commandos, uh, the Yehudu Fighters. There were some groups out here that was armed, ready, locked, and loaded, and did fight back. There were radio stations blown up in this country in the South that nobody hears about in magazines. Um, there were shootouts in, in certain parts that nobody heard about in newspapers. But if you can't say nonviolence worked because the threat of what the Panthers would do, Black Liberation Army to do, the threat of what them brothers in bow ties might do. They were so organized, they had their own economy. And they were nonviolent in themselves, but the threat, you know, that changed things. I'm tired of that chump talk, you know, that sucker talk. And you can't tell me about Selma because I know Reverend Orange. James Orange is my mentor. God bless the dead. You know, I called his wife, told her happy Mother's Day yesterday. So you can't tell me because I didn't see it. I didn't read it. I heard the stories from him. I know Andrew Young. You know, I can call him and get him on the phone now. That's what I'm saying. So I don't, you can tell, you can tell them suckers. I know Hosea Williams. Like, I grew up in this city on Hosea Williams Hill. If you hit Hosea Williams, he was going to hit you back. Jack. Robert Smalls and Buford headed a group called the Black Shirt. The Klan manifested South Carolina originally as the Red Shirts. And so they were marching on Buford, South Carolina, to deal with the black folks who had been done doing so well after the Civil War. So Robert Smalls and the Black Coats, they didn't go after the Red Shirts. They went to the white population in Buford and said, listen here, those are y'all's brothers, y'all stop them or we stop y'all. Nobody talks about that in the history books. Man, that's the beautiful thing about the Second Amendment, man. It apply to everybody. See, man, you got to be proud to be American, man. Let me tell you something, man. You will find no prouder American than this black man right here, man, because all those rights are due to me. Now, I might get inconvenienced. You might pull me over, stop me a little longer. You might... But well, bruh, that gun cleaner than your mama before she met your daddy. So at the end of this encounter, officer, you're going to give me that gun back. I'm going to put that gun back on my front seat, and I'm going to balls off on you. We go back to Nat Turner. He wasn't an anomaly. You know, he was just one of the ones that got recorded. But we've always resisted. And we weren't separated. When, when Turner was brought up in charge, they asked him, who is your leader? It's got to be somebody behind you. He said, yes, I do have a leader. Who's your leader? He said, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So Justin, y'all go find that Negro. 
They went on coming to the job. Well, that was the emperor of Haiti, but he'd been dead for years. So they bring Turner back. That's why you saying this dead man is your leader. He said, my leader is Jean-Jacques Dessalines. He was talking about the spirit of revolution left by blacks who had resisted by arms before. They want you to pull your pants up and go into the gas chambers. They want you to, to act right and walk into your noose. You see, that's, that's all they're, they're asking you to do. And so uh, just, just even looking at how those phrases are termed, First of all, those are connotative sentences or connotative statements. Because you're saying, act right. Well, what is right? Because the European shouldn't be the standard for what is right or who sets forth what is right. Given all that they have done, I don't think anybody would say killing and slaughtering and murdering and pillaging and lynching them, those are right things. So when you look at a people and they're telling you, you need to act right, well, I'm not sure that I would know if you even know what's right. The white supremacists, not only will they target certain black people, they will target their offspring because they understand that certain bloodlines and certain offspring is, is passed down. And greatness sometimes is passed down through the, the bloodline and through families. So a lot of times when you have great black public figures who come out, after they're taken out, a lot of times their family is targeted. Like our brother Malcolm X, when he was taken out, the feds and um, the powers that be would target his wife, they would target his children, his grandchildren. And Dr. Martin Luther King, when he was taken out, a lot of people don't know that his mother was killed in a church in the early 1970s. She was shot in a church. A black man rises up and challenges you effectively. First thing that you have to do is take him out and then ensure that his offspring would not follow in their daddy's footsteps. So whatever you can do to destroy the children of that leader sets an example for anybody else who would consider walking his shoes. So it's, it's, a, it's a war strategy. It's a very effective war strategy. And so if we realize that we are at war and that white supremacy uses any means at their disposal in order to win every battle. But Europeans understand uh, that intelligence is passed down through bloodlines. It's passed down through genetics. So they understand if they want to get rid of uh, revolutionary leaders within uh, a race which they're trying to kill or exterminate, they have to get rid of, it, of entire bloodlines. And so in order to do that, they have to not only just attack the, the spawn or the root, they have to attack every extension off of that spawn or that root. We think like our slave master. If you want to know how the blacks in Barbados behave, Look at the white people that own them. You want to know how the blacks in, in St. Louis behave? Look at the whites who own them. Because they, they taught us. They taught us how to have children, how to discipline children. They said, your children are evil. You have to beat the evil out of them. They were born in evil, beat the evil out of them, beat the hell out of them. See, we, we were taught their system. The only way for them to control us was us to act like them. That's the only way they control us. Now, the month of April has always been a very significant month for the white supremacists. Now, understand that white supremacy is a 24-hour thing. But April is very significant, and you see an increase of violent behavior coming from white supremacist groups because, number one, April is the month of the Patriots' Day, where the so-called patriots, the white supremacists, fought off um, their enemies. Also, April is the month, the birthday of Hitler, so a lot of the white supremacists, they will time a lot of mass shootings or a lot of mass killings around April. When you look at the Columbine shootings, that shooting was done by two white supremacist teens who timed that specifically for April. The Waco situation, that happened in April. The Boston Marathon bombing, that happened in April. So, so many actions of the white supremacists and, and violent acts take place in, um, in April. The um, Oklahoma City bombing, that happened in April. So April is a very significant month for the white supremacists. It's almost like a holy month. There are things at nighttime rituals, which we call nocturnal, and we are sun-centered. Our rituals are we're doing the day with the sun. Even if they go to a restaurant, it's going to be dark with candles like a cave. Because that's where they come from. They're bringing their culture with them. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you inflict it on someone else, then there's something wrong for them saying. Even today, you can go to the country, you see that the name of a bar is called Caverns, Cave. It's not a big thing with the Europeans. So what happened is that they perfected their culture, and we perfected ours of being, sharing with other people, 
There's no overtaking, no but nothing in history that we decimated, a, a, annihilated a race like the Caribbean Indians. And we, there's no history books about that amongst African people, none. But you go into Europeans, you just follow the trail of blood, and you follow the history. One way that white supremacists have always been able to subjugate people is by using germ warfare. This started with the Native Americans when they would come around the natives and give them smallpox, and they saw that disease can kill off more people than the gun. So the white supremacists, they've always used disease to decimate people with AIDS, with Ebola, with all types of other diseases so they can kill off the people and take the land because they understand if you violently try to take people off their land. Sometimes you destroy the land. They understood that with Japan by dropping atom bombs and all this stuff on people. What happens is that you'll kill the people, but then you'll destroy the land and the land will be useless. Ebola's in Nigeria. At the same time, Nigeria is supplying 20 odd percent of its oil to China, who is our new Russia, who we need to make sure has a cap on how much gas they can use. So now we got troops in Nigeria just chilling. And the reason is Ebola. We got troops in the Eastern Horn of Africa because there are skirmishes and there are pirates there. It looks to me, though, that's the only place fuel can go in and out of by ship. So in case it ever gets stupid, then you know who can close it off. So I just look at the world from a bigger context. And scientists now have so perfected this art of germ warfare that they have developed melanin-specific viruses. And how pneumonia has been spreading throughout the black community. The pneumonia virus has mutated to the point now where it used to be cured with, with an injection 10 years ago. Now there's so many forms of pneumonia out here that are taking people out left and right. Working with Tulane University and Columbia University have a lab in all three of those countries that's producing bacterial warfare. And one of the things they're producing was producing is Ebola and the CDC owns the patent on the, this Ebola virus that just wreaked havoc over West Africa. I remember reading in the Washington Post magazine about 15 years ago about uh, an article, uh, a CIA, CIA agent who was in Africa and he had an assignment and, and something went wrong and he decided to scrap this assignment and he threw this suitcase it was filled with the Ebola virus in a lake, threw it away. And then a short time later, Ebola breaks out in that community. So these mysterious viruses that just show up and only seem to target specific people, we have to begin to recognize that as a potential form of genetic warfare. The most modern instance is the Ebola situation in West Africa. Um, Ebola jumped from the Congo to West Africa and missed all those other countries. That was a flying virus. It must have took wings. ISIS is, is not only uh, a political and economic scheme, but a spiritual scheme based on a metaphysical level because now they're taking the name of our ancient African goddess and they're framing it in terms of malevolence as though it's bad. So. You know, when, when African people start to promote African culture more and, and, and the name of ISIS is, is being spewed into the atmosphere, uh, you know, just through us revering that, that spiritual system of ancient Kemet, white people who may over here say, oh, ISIS, and thinking that we're terrorists. So they're indirectly associating those things and making them overlap, even though one is created by them and for malevolent means, and one is uh, in reverence of our culture. Shell isn't going to stop building pipes there. British Petroleum's not gonna start laying pipes because of an Ebola outbreak. So the question becomes to me, like, is there, is there for real? Is there, are we knocking people off? And people then they say you're a conspiracy theorist, but my great grandfather's father was a part of the Tuskegee experiment. So yeah, I believe in conspiracy theories because it has affected my life. So you gotta start asking yourself if a disease just pops up out of nowhere again and again, and the people are dying, but yet darn land is needed for oil, what's you know, one of many things could be happening. What I do know is I don't buy what they tell me on TV. They used the syphilis uh, on us. And people think, oh, they just took a couple people and gave them syphilis. No, 
what they did, they infected men with syphilis and then they let them go without treatment, without even knowing they have syphilis, to spread it to their wives and their girlfriends and thus throughout the black community for decades while they studied the effects of syphilis on the human body by guinea pigging these Africans. That was just one instance right here in the United States. The medicines that Africans have been using for hundreds of years are known to the Western world. You get in the bush and you'll find folk, who I, I remember when I was in Ethiopia back in uh, 19, 1985 and met this Ethiopian herbologist who had a cure for cancer. And he showed us his patients, he showed us before and after pictures of him curing um, cancer cells on people's bodies by using specific herbs. And he talked about the differences between using uh, certain herbs that are designed to cure certain, to kill certain diseases and certain viruses as opposed to pharmaceutically produced chemicals that will kill certain viruses, but they have side effects. So you take other medications for the side effects, but these specific herbs are targeted only to focus on certain cancers or certain diseases and take them out without affecting other parts of the body. Those herbologists, those scientists, those chemists still exist in Africa today. People live about 150, 200 easy, 200 years old. That's, the health was superior. You wouldn't go to Africa and get somebody with arthritis, rheumatism, diabetes to pick your damn cotton. I mean, that's absurd. You wouldn't get some healthy people if you're trying to make some money. So, so you weren't there for that. White supremacists, they would take the skin of African slaves and actually make shoes out of them. This is something that they don't like to talk about. Even today, there's a company over in Europe that makes shoes and leather products based on human skin. Right now to this day, they make leather products based on human skin. Our communities are ridden with, with products that have GMOs. Uh, more likely to find products with GMOs in our supermarkets in our neighborhoods than you will in other neighborhoods. And why are GMOs critical? Because it's been shown not only are they cancerous, but they destroy nervous system tissues, they destroy brain tissue, and so they impede our cognitive development. So we have to begin to be more concerned about nutrition. You have power when you can control your eating capacity. When you got to depend on Piggly Wiggly or Stop and Shop or any of the other supermarkets for your food, I don't care how many millions you have, if you can't grow your own food, you don't have power. Power is the ability to eat. So even if you got that little garden in your backyard or on your windowsill in a project and you're growing your own food, you have power. Because if all those stores shut down, you can continue to eat. And in continuing to eat, you can continue to live. White supremacists will say and do anything in order to get one up on melanated people. They will lie, steal, kill, cheat, whatever it takes. This is why many of the white supremacists will renege on all of the treaties that they've agreed to because African people and melanated people don't really know exactly what they're dealing with. They don't understand that there is no honor system with the white supremacists. So we have to go back into their history like they go into our history. You understand? They, they have more books about Egyptian and, and our history than we do. So to understand black people, you have to go into African history. And to understand Europeans, you have to go into the cave history and cave civilization. White supremacy was not used. It's just a system they used to protect themselves. And to protect yourself, you have to develop deceit and deception. They love us in the sense that, not, not in the sense that they uh, respect us or want to treat us fairly, but they love us the way uh, a master loves his dog. You know, like they don't, you know, they, they, the dog can be almost like a member of the family, but they'll never let the dog sit down at the dinner table. They'll never treat the dog as if he's as important as one of the members of that family, right? But if the dog tries to run away, they'll go chase the dog down. You know, they, they, you know, you kill the dog, they're going to be sad about it. And I think that white people um, historically 
have always seen us as part of their infrastructure, you know, going back to slavery. I mean, you needed your slaves because you were making money from your slaves. You need your slaves to nurse your children. In order to maintain your power, you perpetuate the weakest of a culture and make them look like the strongest and have the sheep follow. And you'll always keep them down. You take the dominant culture and you say to them, all right, these individuals are getting an education, they're developing pride, they're coming out with dignity, they're looking out for their mothers, their sisters, their, their wives, their girlfriends. We have to do something about that. That's too good. We don't want them to understand the value of those kinds of things, those kind of actions. So we have to do, use our propaganda to point these guys as rebel rousers and these individuals as heroes. So if you look at who is put in front of the black community, it is usually those athletes who have nothing to say. They do not rock the boat. They do just the opposite of that. And then they get praised by the white media. It's like people do with the pig today. Say the pig is filthy. Look at them, they're rolling in their own bowel movement. Look at the filthy. Pigs are not filthy. They in the hippopotamus family. If you put them in their own environment, they'd be in the bath all day. But since they can't get around water, they roll in their own manure. They ain't nothing filthy about no pig in their environment. You see, and we taking the, we, that's why I'm putting it in the context of the environment that it was in. There's nothing wrong with black people. You got them in the wrong environment. <laughs> In this environment, yeah, they lie to each other. Yeah, they sell cocaine. Yeah, they, you follow me? Yeah, they're stealing people. This is the environment. Over in Africa, when the, the white supremacists were colonizing many of the African nations, they had treaties with a lot of them. A lot of them wrote down treaties and made agreements and made deals, and they reneged on all of them. And the Native Americans, again, the white supremacists made deals and reneged on the deals because they honored the deals once they got in the mix and were able to claim to be part native themselves their treaties now especially the treaty of 1866 that shows that black people who are freedmen's at the time should get some of the same benefits and resources as the native american tribes but these treaties are not honored and it's it's on paper there's no reason for them to not honor the treaties even the constitution is not really honored in favor of black people because we're supposed to get equal protection under the law but we're not getting equal protection under the law so a, a, a treaty or constitution or document is only as valid as those who can enforce it and nobody is enforcing these treaties and laws for melanated people fast forward into the 60s you had the hippies who were the hippies it was whites pretending to be indians look at that culture again go back and you will see they were striking teepees all over the place, intermingling, even naming themselves after Native Americans. All of the maps you see is wrong. You have to look at Peter's projection. Peter's projection showed you that Africa is twice as long as what you see, and Europe is twice as small. So we got to go to Peter's projection to see the true size of Africa, because we've been lied to with maps, lied to with history. Obama said that he had a, an international meeting and they asked him about racism in America and he said, yeah, there's racism, but it's getting better. There's no such thing as better racism. There's no such thing as progressive racism. That's like saying we got rape, but rape is getting better. You either have racism or you don't. And we have systematic white supremacy and we need to replace that with a system of justice. White abolitionists, how you feel about John Brown? That's my bar. That's my bar. So. We, if, if a Quaker wanted me free, okay, that was cool. I buy Quaker oats, but he wasn't willing to put that pistol in his hand and his rifle on his shoulder and knock a head off of me. Now, if you're willing to do that, I'm down with you. And that's what John Brown was willing to do. So what I'm going to tell you is study the white abolitionists. Study the ones who was willing to pick up arms and kill with you. Whenever you talk about racism, a lot of the white supremacists will try to pull the Jedi mind trick and start talking about slavery, antebellum slavery talking about, well, slavery is years ago and there's no more slavery. White supremacy is slavery. Being subjugated is slavery. So we live in slavery now. The prison industrial complex is slavery, where they can criminalize you and make you work against your will. That's slavery. You know, my situation when I was walking on the flag and then you fast forward about a month later and you had this Dylan Roof case uh, coming about. And not only was he walking on the flag, but burning the flag, but then he went even farther and killed nine people. 
you see. You, you saw right then and there the white psychology and their alignment with white people regardless of what they do. Any black man who, who is against the white supremacist structure and, and is willing to stand uh, by any means against any threats is indeed going to be considered a terrorist towards white supremacy. So even with me uh, doing what I'm doing in the community, I may not be out uh, you know, inciting riots or waging physical war on Europeans, but the simple fact that black men want to come together and build their communities, that may automatically makes you uh, an even greater terrorist, because you're already by default a terrorist just based on your melanin and your genetic dominance. However, now you, you're a political and economic and physical uh, terrorist towards this white supremacist structure. So Spengarn worked in concert with the United States government in order to give them the list of African Americans who were part of this organization who the government believed was subversive. So on one hand, you've got people like Spengarn who are funding this organization and using it as a front to identify the thinkers within the black community so that they could be effectively neutralized one way or the other. But for them still to give the Spingard Award to black people, when Spingard himself was turning over the membership list to Army Intelligence. That's deep right there. And that's, that's why, that means you're addicted to white supremacy right there. They exist, and they've been in the NAACP, and they've been in the National Urban League, and they were in SNCC, they were in the Black Panthers, they were in the Nation of Islam, and they were in Dr. Martin Luther King's movement. They were there. And they will be in every other movement. The question becomes, at what point does the masses of our people become so strong that their presence amongst us does not matter? And that's when you're going to make a change. Because Malcolm was real clear. The one thing about Malcolm is that you never had to send an agent in on Malcolm, because Malcolm would tell you to your face, see, you didn't need someone to spy on Malcolm. Because Malcolm wasn't covert with his stuff. He was in your face telling you exactly what was going on. This has nothing to do with selling your soul. I mean, when you look at it that way, okay. Yeah, but it depends on how you look at it. Sure. You insult my intelligence when they, and not only they insult me, period. If they think I would tell them anything. But uh, it, it, it would uh, it would be good, and I think uh, in, in many ways it might uh, might be of some benefit to your organization. You know, if, yes. if in fact we can eliminate people. There's no government agency that can ever expect any information out of me that's in any way detrimental to any religious group or black group, for that matter, in this country. So there's always been some type of backlash for any illusion of progress for black people because the white supremacists, they judge their well-being on how bad black people are doing. As long as black people are doing worse, the white supremacists are fine. Anytime there's any progress with black people, the white supremacists go on alert and they will go behind the scenes and do everything they can to subjugate and thwart the progress of black people. I just learned recently of a think tank in Washington, D.C. that came to the State Department a couple of years ago and gave a report to the State Department. This is a think tank that does projections 200 years into the future. And they were able to state, based on their data, how many wealthy people you would have, how many poor people you would have, where that wealth and where that poverty would be concentrated. And as a result of those projections, they then can set up institutions to ensure that those projections come true. 92% of the global population are people of color. So that means that the global resources are being controlled by 8% of the people. I mean, but if we start to think of ourselves in this way, then it becomes really insidious in how, how systematic this, uh, this, this has been built. 
to con convince people around the world that they are minorities. I mean, that takes a lot of power to do that. So if you can imagine the power it took to create that kind of mindset, and of course it's going to take equal amount of power to maintain it. To get a banking, to be able to open a bank, the kinds of things that a black person would have to go through to get approval versus what a white person or even other foreign nationals would have to go through is extraordinary, you know, because our approval is predicated on the whites who are sitting behind the desk seeing us as their competitors. We somehow think that white people are supposed to congratulate us when we make progress, that they're going, that they're supposed to be happy for us, <laughs> that they're going to give us their blessing for taking resources that they feel belong to them. No, the other team will never congratulate you for scoring more points. White men created the ghetto. They determined where we would live. And once they determined where we would live, they then would determine where the resources would go. Schools would be built outside of that community. Grocery stores would be developed outside of that community. Resources would be diverted from one segment of town, one area of town, to another area of town in order to produce generations of poverty. You can enslave people right on their land. You don't have to put them behind bars or what Neely Fuller calls greater confinement. Stalin learned how to decimate the Ukrainian people by making their neighborhoods and their country a prison. What he did was control the resources that came in and out of the Ukraine. And what he did was create a forced starvation. In the 1920s and 30s, millions of Ukrainian people starved to death based on Stalin cutting off the resources and literally making their neighborhoods and their homes prisons because they couldn't get out, they couldn't bring food in, and they took their weapons. So basically, people sat around and starved. And they still do this now in black so-called areas around the country. They control the resources that come in and out. They don't allow black people to get certain jobs. They don't allow black people to get certain education. And they understand that this creates a prison. White supremacy is a prison. White supremacy is slavery, and people are negatively affected from that prison slave system. Keeping a control over their inheritance, simply just in occupying these institutions and not allowing black blackness in, in any way possible. We got the Voting Rights Act passed. We got the Desegregation Act passed. We got the, the integration of the schools, which I didn't agree with, passed. And there was a backlash. That backlash was economic. Because they said, okay, we gotta let you in the schools. Government said, we're gonna do that. Okay, we gotta let you vote. We'll do that. But the one thing we can stop you from doing is making capital at the most basic level. So all the jobs y'all are doing, we're gonna open our borders and we're gonna bring in 12 million people who we're gonna call illegal immigrants. No nation in the world allows that to occur. Two Americans go to Mexico today, like the young white man, the Marine. He stumbled across the border and they threw him in jail. Another way that the white supremacists will deprive resources is to create all white unions. This is why all white unions were started, to keep black workers out of the workplace. And this is why a lot of lynchings were happening, because a lot of black workers would go to these cities and they would be strike breakers. These unions would um, have strikes and the company owners would bring in black workers and the white supremacists would just lynch these people and run them out of town so they couldn't take those jobs. And there's nobody that really does anything about that. Uh, in many cases, uh, that power was supported through violence. Um, you know, if you tried to uh, challenge the labor unions, you, you might you might get a baseball bat upside your head or a bullet in your back. Um, and, and to this day, um, you know, when you go on many of the jobs that I, that I see in this city, uh, I almost never see African Americans as a part of that, and um, and that that's just incredibly problematic. There was um, a cigar company that had on the box these cigars are made by a white union men so they would brag on their products this product was made by white men that product was made by white men in the union so they would brag about having all white unions you never educate a person you're going to dominate that's a no-no you train them so we're trained to hold jobs we're trained to be taught a certain way we're not trained so that you can begin to create and yet, blacks create everything you can think of. You go back through the list of inventions by black, almost everything you find out there was invented by a black person. If you look at Koreatown, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was 
like this. Now it's bigger than in our surroundings because the Koreans didn't mind saying this is Korea town. Koreans will deal with Koreans. Where black folks say we will keep struggling to deal with white folks. If we begin to focus on wealth like every other ethnic group, you know, I'm not telling you to reinvent the wheel. This is not rocket science. Take care of your own first. Employ your own first. Do what every other ethnic group has done. And that's the key to success and financial growth and development. We have to regain the, the pride that comes with institution building. Because institutions are the only way you can support the masses. You can't support the masses by integrating uh, into a pre-existing system, especially one that's designed to oppress you. Because, uh, you know, no one's going to let you move into their, their house and, and move around all the furniture. They're just not going to do that. Where they just ran highways of freeways right through the middle of the black city. Moses was the only, he did it in New York, he did it in the Bronx, he did it in Queens, but they did it in Miami. They ran the major highway right through the black community in Miami, broken it up in four pieces. And now they have four different little black sub running those communities. They did it in Jacksonville, Florida. They did it in South Carolina in Myrtle Beach. They ran Highway 17 straight through the black community and wiped it out. Wherever there was a prosperous black community in America, they used the concept of new freeways and stadiums to displace and, and misplace these people over the last 30 years. And then in the 1950s, when Dwight Eisenhower came up with this idea of developing a federal highway system, they decided to run all of these highways through the black community, dividing it in half, this highway, uh, buying up all the property, not compensating the owners those houses properly and then running this highway system right through the black community and in every instance you had these cars trucks driving through this highway in the middle of the black community so think about this from the 50s and the 60s they were driving vehicles filled with leaded gasoline and so that lead now would create a cloud of, of, of lead poison it would flow up, up out of that highway into the communities, into the house. So what we now begin to realize is, is that the high levels of lead poisoning within the black community was not due to lead paint. I don't know any, any child who eats lead paint. It was due to the lead fumes from the cars. That's why they began taking the lead out of automobiles because it was not only affecting black folk, it was affecting other people within the community as well. So when we began to look at you know, targeted extermination. Public assistance should be a stepping stone. And I do understand that there are so many members of our society who are in need of help and should get help. But when you get help in the way in which they're giving us help, they then can control you. Like for instance, now they're passing laws where if you receive public assistance, you can't use it to go to the movies. There are certain foods that you cannot buy. You can't buy lobster, you can't eat out. They're saying if we're gonna give you money, this is what we're gonna do. So they control and they contain you. People don't like to give the streets their credit, but the people who've been successful, that's what they love to tell you about. So I'm from the South. Man, our white successful people here that love NASCAR, they love to tell you NASCAR was started because of bootleg. Oh, they love to give you the story because it's racy and dangerous. And some of my Italian brothers and sisters, they love to tell you about their cousin or their uncle or their grand uncle that used to drive for Al Capone or maybe, you know, hung out with this. They love to tell you because they crossed that hump. And how did the hump get crossed? Well, the hump got crossed because one or two generations were willing to involve themselves in crime. So I actually salute the brothers that have involved themselves in the streets that made it out. The brothers that were able to buy shops, to buy real estate, to transition into legitimate business. I salute you and I encourage more brothers that are in the streets to do that. There has been an organized effort against allowing African-American to develop an economic base from which to fuel its community development. And we have never applied ourselves to a community after the desegregation took place and we started leaving the whole family concept in the South and coming North and giving up our businesses and giving up our families and chasing after what we call integration, which means to be with that man, 
to be a part of that man's culture. And that man didn't want us a part of his culture, and we wanted to spend our money. And so we would actually spend millions of dollars in the culture that didn't want us to be a part of it, which is foolish as hell, because if you look at the Jewish community, they understood how to work with each other and became a very powerful, powerful community. The largest African-American insurance company in these United States insured most ins black people in these United States at one point, at least in the Southeast. It was started by a man who had a whites-only barbershop. His name was Lando Hearn, and he was a black man. But he only cut rich white businessmen and hair in one of his barbershops. He picked up hella gang. He got those black men. Those barbers lived a lot better than a lot of the barbers because of the price of the haircuts they were charging. And he was able to successfully build his empire off other people's dollar. Money is people. That's what money is. Money is people. A dollar is stored wealth, is stored labor. It's money is people. And the first money was people. If I want to get something done, I say, well, you help me build my house. And I say, okay, uh, you can have my son for 20 years. He's now your indentured slave. You follow me? I pay for you this service with my children. The first money is people, and we haven't gotten past that. Every human organism, regardless of their ethnicity, uh, has to have a period of time to rest. So the brain can recharge itself. Meditation and silence and quietness allows the brain to come at peace and permits other higher levels of consciousness, including creativity, to take place by keeping you busy, constantly either working for somebody else, having your dollars circulate outside of your community, keeping you under stress with laws and systematic subjugation of people of color, gives you no time to have that period where you can be at peace, where you can rest, where you can regenerate and recharge your brain so that the neurons themselves can, can rip can replicate and reproduce themselves in ways that are healthy to the organism. And you study the history of Booker Washington. There's a book out, a young lady's put out about Booker. You see that Garvey came here to implement Booker's program. Because Booker was already doing works in Africa. And, and one must question, why did he die so mysteriously just before Garvey got here, when they were about to hook up in Union? Rich people that left Europe to come to America did not go to Ellis Island. They went to Soundview in the Bronx. That's where, they, that's where their boats went. Rich people went to the Bronx. And the poor people went to Ellis Island. And this is another part of history that's never really discussed. Racism was not just regulated to the South. And also when you look at the North, um, in New York, there's a slave plantation called Sylvester Manor that was right off Long Island. It's still in existence right now. It's a tourist attraction right now in New York that a lot of people go to. Down in Birmingham, Alabama, they have a, a slave plantation that's still in existence called the Arlington Plantation. And it's right in the middle of the what's called West End area, which is a black area. And West End has gone through so much gentrification that the place now is just decimated. There's dilapidated houses, and around all this degradation, there's this sprawling, bright plantation. And when I went there to the Arlington Plantation, which is on Cotton Avenue, by the way, the name of the street is Cotton Avenue, and I'm there, and across the street from it is a housing project. And outside the housing project, there's a lot of black people, poor, begging. And I'm looking at the plantation, and I'm trying to find out where the slave quarters were. And then I realized, because I couldn't see the slave quarters around the back of the building, but I realized standing across the street inside of the housing project or in front of the housing project, this is the slave quarters. This must have been where the slave quarter was. So when you look at history, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed as far as racial history. Let every black person who works hard get everything they deserve because then that would take something away from white people. So the way it ends up becoming a little bit like that movie, The Hunger Games, where you have masses of the oppressed and you take a couple of people out of the oppressed group and you let them be successful. You treat them even better than you treat yourself and you hold these people up as beacons of hope so that you can uh, maintain them. And you're telling these people, look, if you behave, if you endure your oppression, if you allow us to treat you a certain way and don't complain about it, you might have the opportunity to win the, the Negro lottery and become one of these esteemed elite black people who are successful. And that just does not work. What happened here was an alternate, an alternative labor force was allowed in this country to do the work 
that the African-American population was doing as a punishment to the African-American population and to handle the residuals, they escalated the prison industrial complex. We understood economic development, the value of it. We understood banking and how to use our investment dollars and how to use the power of the influence athletes had. And uh, the athletes and entertainers and MBAs came together in the Black Economic Union to create uh, business opportunities for young, you know, black entrepreneurs. When the Russian uh, Russian billionaire used Jay Z to convince the city of Brooklyn to uh, to dumb down the negotiating strategy for jobs in the community, you had Cornell West who was out there with with a lot of people picketing and saying, you know, we, we you won't build an arena in this area unless you give jobs to people in this community. And so what they did was they went and they hired Jay Z, put him on a billboard, made it, and people believe he was a team owner when really he only owned one one fifteen hundredth of the team. Um, and that caused a lot of people to uh, back away from supporting Cornell West because they felt that they were helping their community by helping this symbolic uh, token black person uh, to achieve his dream of team ownership, which really wasn't even true ownership to begin with. We're the only group on the planet that allows, you know, some other group, culture, whatever, to come in and take our dollars. And I'm not blaming them. That's common sense. They're serving our community. But you mean to tell me there's not an entrepreneur out there who got an idea for a gym shoe? And, well, and what do we know? Black males, we buy one out of every five pairs of shoes that Nike manufactures. Black females, we are 6% of the population. We buy, tw black females buy 27% of all shoes and cologne manufactured here in the United States. You mean to tell me there's not a black woman out there that wants to manufacture shoes, that has an idea for a cologne. Well, we have got to find these individuals and we got to bankroll them to make sure that becomes reality. Do what every other ethnic group has done. All you have to do is make sure that Europeans intermarry with each other and pass the wealth on. Intermarry with each other, pass the wealth on. Intermarry with each other, pass the wealth on. And then that's how it stays in white hands. And then once you've got the opposite going on in the black community, our inability to second generation it, then we're not in a position to, even when we make any money, we can't pass it on. And essentially, those are the two strategies that run parallel. Wealth and, and wealth being passed down, the white supremacists, they make sure that wealth is not passed down within black society because they want to have black children start off with nothing. When you start off with nothing, you start off struggling. They understand that your life is going to be difficult from that point on. And this is why they didn't allow black people to even have life insurance because black people dying, their children could get money to start off with like a little nest egg and they could possibly prosper. But what the white supremacists would do, they would let black people get burial insurance. So if a black person died up until the 1960s, you would just get enough money to bury your loved ones. But they wouldn't allow black people for the most part to get life insurance. How do you control the black community? Take one from the record industry, the music industry, which is called the Columbia study. Now it wasn't Columbia University that did the study. It was Harvard University that did the study for Columbia Records. And Columbia Records wanted to know in the, in the 60s, how do we control this music with all these black people? The music is making billions of dollars, potentially. But how do we get control of it? Because black folks are demanding more and more. And, the, and, and what, what the Harvard study showed Columbia Records was, listen, let them control everything except distribution. You can give them the labels. They can control their, their catalog, but you stay in control of distribution, and thus you control the economics of the record industry. You're going to have to restructure your thinking, and you're going to have to say, okay, what's valuable about me? Well, what's valuable about you is you are African and American, which means you have a face that will give you a pass anywhere in the world. Man, you don't know the feeling as a black man until you get off a plane in Europe and people look at you like you God, for real. Like, I'm not playing. They look at you like, what you do? You're special, you're Nigerian, you're a doctor, you're alpha, you. What do you do? But you get, you walk with a different step, a different pride. So my thing is, you have that. You ha Once you get outside of this, you see how glorious you are. And you have an access to money.
And your dollar means a lot more across seas. And you can take that money and you can start doing something else besides whatever we're doing here now that's not working for us here. And that's just the truth. You know, you look at Steve Jobs, you look at Bill Gates, you look at the six black billionaires, you look at Kathy Hughes, you look at Bob Johnson, the BET, you look at Dave Stewart, Worldwide Telecom. They all use the same pattern. Number one, what is it that you love to do? What do you have a passion for? What can you throw your whole heart and soul into? Question number two, you know, what would you do for free? If no one gave you financial reward for your efforts, if no one gave you financial remuneration for your efforts, what would you do because of the sheer love, you know, of, of doing it? Never do it for the money. If you do it for the money, you're going to fail. I mean, the greatest competitive advantage in the world is the passionate, committed mind. The passionate, committed mind cannot be defeated. white supremacists like to show dominance is by using sexual exploitation. People who are dominated socially can be dominated sexually. Sex is a way in which you show your domination. It's like a male dog gets on another male dog and humps on him. He's not after the sex he's showing, he dominates. I'm in control. If you have a system in place to guarantee your very survival, you will use any means at your disposal. So sex then becomes a tool. Uh, this whole idea of creating a mulatto cast is designed to create a buffer between the whites and the blacks. You give more privileges to this mulatto cast. Even Chancellor Williams, in, uh, in his book, uh, he, he was claiming that due to a biracial population which came about from uh, Greek uh, mixing with, with the indigenous African population there, uh, it rose up another army which fought against their African mothers and fathers. In Africa, when the Europeans came in, the Portuguese would mate with the, the Africans and their offspring would be called Lancados. And the Lancados were the offspring of African and, and Europeans. And what happened was the Lancados, the mixed offspring of the Europeans and the Africans, they became slave traders themselves because, again, a lot of biracial children would take on the ideology of the father. So whenever you see people talk about, well, Africans sold other Africans, this is really who they're talking about. When the Inquisition came, many of the Jews left Portugal and went to West Africa. This is during the period of, of, of the 14, 1500s. And they became the people who were running the slave trade. Some were Christians, some were Jews, many were Jews. And what they would do was marry African women, usually from a chieftaincy family or somebody where they can get in good. And they would use the offspring of these marriage to be the middleman in the slave trade. That went on all over West Africa. It was the mulattoes who did Haiti as much, if not more harm, than the French. Because there, there's this thing about you know, white supremacy is a very infectious disease. And when you buy into the lie that white or light skin is superior to black or dark skin, then we'll find instances where a mixed race black would be more vicious than a white person because they have to prove to the white person that I'm on your side, I'm okay. Mulattoes have always been used. The French were good at that, setting it up in Trinidad. They had the different staircases of mulattoes and octagons, octagons, they had different classification of mulattoes. And they give the mulattoes the power over the darker skinned ones. And then on top of the, the mulattoes were the white people. It's another way of buffering yourself from the attack. So when black people get angry, they got to go through to beat the mulattoes to get to the white people. So that was actually a buffer zone in the manipulation and controlling the people. You had a ship full of African men, women, and children who were at the mercy of the captain and all the sailors on that crew. And those men could have sex with anybody they wanted to. The women, the children, and the men. You had to see three months tied down with these white men. There ain't no women there for the most part. When they start bringing women, they weren't even bringing women. They were bringing girls between the ages of 6 and 15 and raping them all. But they also were raping the men. Same things are happening on the plantation to demasculinize the black men. 
control the slave population is uh, to rape a father in front of his sons uh, or to take the biggest, baddest black man on the plantation and do something horrible to him to completely humiliate and emasculate him so that people won't respect him anymore. And, uh, and that still happens to this day. In the Caribbean, they had seasoning plantations, which were plantations used to break the slaves. And one plantation or one place that had a lot of seasoning plantations was Jamaica. And people have to wonder, what were they doing on these seasoning plantations that was worse than what was happening on the regular plantations? Well, one thing that they were doing on these plantations, especially in Jamaica, they were doing a process called buck breaking where the white supremacist slave owner or the white supremacist um, overseer would literally rape black men in front of the whole black population in order to break his spirit, in order to break him down as a man, in order to show dominance against him, in order to show the rest of the black population that this is not your leader. I just made your leader submit to me sexually. And this happened a lot in Jamaica. This is why homosexuality is so looked down upon in Jamaican culture today. And it was a way primarily of cutting down those who would rebel. In other words, it was, it was a matter of power and control and domination. And they would call it buck busting, but it was really butt busting. Slavery continued until 1865 for about two generations, right? So how do you reconcile that? You can no longer bring in Africans, but you still have the business of slavery. So they still needed Africans to do the work down south, especially after the cotton gin was invented. So you had the creation of breeding farms. Two of the largest slave breeding farms in the United States were on the eastern shore of Maryland and right outside of Richmond, Virginia. They literally bred black people like cattle. They would have a strong black man have sex with a healthy black woman. That woman could be his mother, his sister, his aunt, his cousin. It didn't matter because the end product was produce a child that I can sell, bodies that I can sell and ship down to Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. It was a business. We had breeding farms in the United States that, that, that would put one person from one plantation against another. We even had a system where if you were a breeder, male on one plantation, or a female on another plantation, or even on the same plantation, even if you were mother and son, they would mate you. And so I, I tell a lot of my patients and a lot of my friends, you gotta stop using the MF word because that was a description of what actually happened when the paper bag would go over the head to put one breeder against another when they were related. Incest. Take the Eastern Shore of Maryland, for example, right? Most people live within a 50 mile radius of where they were born. A large percentage of the people who lived on the Eastern Shore of Maryland during this time of these breeding farms migrated to Baltimore. Baltimore, Maryland has, is the incest capital of the United States of America. And according to uh, statistics by uh, my colleague, Dr. Um, Patricia Newton, who's a psychiatrist in Baltimore, in that area in Baltimore, uh, Sandtown, where you had these recent rebellions, nine out of 10 black women in the depressed parts of Baltimore, nine out of 10 black women have been victims of incest. In the same area, seven out of 10 black men have been victims of incest. Watch the news channels here in America and see how many mixed race black men and women are forecasting the news in America today. Don't miss it. Don't miss who's on the television screen talking to us. That black skinned woman or man is peripherally there. This mulatto, who I don't blame for their condition, but if you accept that role in society, then you got to take responsibility for what comes from it. You saw in, in the movie Precious, right? Monique won, a, won an Oscar for her role in Precious. Incest, uh, she had um, sexual relationships with her own daughter, right? Um, her daughter was sexually molested by her father in the movie. When Monique was on the Oprah Winfrey show talking about that film, she talked about the fact that what helped to prepare for that role was 
her thinking about how she was sexually molested by her own brother, right? Oprah had Monique's brother on her show and asked him point blank, did you know what you were doing when you sexually molested your own sister? He said, well, I was sexually molested by my uncle ever since I was a little boy. I thought this was natural. Everybody did it. So we look at the socialization of deviant behavior that was set in motion over 100 years ago that is still playing itself out in our communities right now. So until we can understand our history, until we can understand the pain that we're still going through, uh, the mental anguish that we're still going through, and, and begin to realize how that shapes our thinking, our speech, and our actions today, we'll never be able to heal ourselves or effectively deal with the problems that we still have in our communities. Because there was once, back in the days of apartheid, a professor came forth and stated, we cannot love you, African man, because to love you would mean that we would die. Because we gave him the keys to the castle. I said, what's making these people so powerful? I said, family. I destroy the family, I destroy the empire. So they sold your mother one way and your father another way. They destroyed the family. That's what destroyed Africa. So we had to build family. A black man and a black woman in love, raising a healthy child is the most dangerous thing on this planet. We're looking for a gun. The gun is the relationship. Some of the ways that black people can empower themselves, some of the solutions. One solution is what I call the CMB mentality. The C is basically you got to get a code of conduct, a way you think, a way you do business, a way you interact with other melanoid people. So we have to, first of all, condition our youth uh, and insulate them with knowing who they are, not, not what someone else has described them to be. We have to not permit everything and everybody to come in and define us. You know, we, 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 we take on the definitions of others. And, and unfortunately, those definitions were never designed to make us be empowered. Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark used to say, you never expect powerful people to teach powerless people how to gain power. Oh yes, you do need to vote locally because you need the type of characters that you know in office. You need to have somebody on the city council you can yell at when you go to church with their mama. And the only way that's going to happen, on the zoning board, okay, you got a business you want to open. Man, you can have your homeboy run for office, get on the zoning board. You can do that. But you got to understand politics locally. You got to go to your PTA means. You got to go to your neighborhood association means. You got to go to the city council means. You got to begin get out in your community again. Estrange yourself from the Republican and the Democratic Party. Create your own. The Democrats and the Republicans are two fangs on the same snake. First, you can't learn all these things in the public school system. Or, and that includes college. You have to learn on your own outside of the system. You have to do your self-education, your self-evaluation, which means you're going to be lonely because nobody likes a smart Negro. I mean, if you were trying to be intelligent, talk about your history and be more aware, you're going to turn a lot of black people off. The loneliness will drive you back and just getting a hair relaxer, you know, the loneliness of being intelligent. <laughs> One of the challenges that black people have had is that our very psyche has been fractured through slavery, colonization, segregation, discrimination, Jim Crow. No people on the planet have gone through what we have gone through. So we've got to recognize that as a fundamental reality. That still shapes and drives our consciousness. So we are dysfunctional people. You know, we've been programmed to be dysfunctional. So it's going to take a special type of, 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 of concentration of thought and energy in order to repair our psyches. So in that context, we also can see very clearly that no people on this planet have gone through what we've gone through and progress to the extent that we progress. So that to me is an indicator that there's something in us. There's a presence, there's a power, there's a spirit, there's a force, whatever you want to call it, that's in us that has protected us to some extent. Despite all the negativity that we've gone through, something has protected us and allowed us to make something out of nothing and rise to the top despite all the opposition in our wake. Know who you are, know the people you come from, 
and be clear about where you're going and make sure that you leave something behind that's worth remembering. We, we have to start to look at education. We have to begin to educate our own children. You know, people say, do you, can white people teach child, uh, black children? Yes, they can. I've known many good European math teachers, good science teachers. My problem is that they should not teach children. My challenge is we should be teaching them. That's my situation. And that's why I've taken full responsibility as it relates to the work that I do to educate our community and to educate our people and specifically our children. If, if we don't do it, if we don't love and support and empower ourselves, uh, then nobody will. Stop waiting for white people to give you permission to love yourself. There's nothing wrong with, with, with black love, even though they somehow flip that into white hatred, which we know that it's not. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, that establishing that awareness, uh, putting it into action, liberating yourself um, economically and educationally, and then liberating others, uh, those are the steps we need to take. But we have to realize it's going to be a long-term process. To examine yourself and apply yourself Whatever the available tools, use them and maximize them. And set a plan of success based upon the fact that you will never give up or give in. And then look for others like yourself to share that particular dream, that particular attitude. And to gain control of the education of our children by telling those people who are in our community if you're going to come with your racist attitude, you come with your racist books, you come with your, your anti-black that said you're not going to teach my children the history, then I want you out of my community tomorrow. I'm going to close the schools down. It's better that the schools are closed down than to create more cripples for the prison industrial complex. But at the end of the day, you have to be responsible for your own education. Find out who you are. Find out what you were put here for. See the world, mentor a child, engage in the type of connections with people that give you aha moments so that you know what you've been put here to do. And then go and develop that skill. Buy whatever cheap houses or land you can, refurbish those, rent them out, live there if you can. Start directing African American children to trade schools, to trade schools and computer trades in particular, but trade, trade, trade. Steer our children. Um, away from college into the trades. The M, the M means that we have to militarize our mindset. The white supremacists are taught this mindset of this mentality through the Rambo movies. When you look at the Rambo movies, it's about the Sylvester Stallone character being dropped off with limited weaponry. And he has to fight against advanced weapons from these advanced armies. And he learns how to use his mind and his military training in order to survive. So he weaponizes everything. So this is something that's taught to the white supremacists. But we think that we got to have tanks and rocket launchers and all that stuff. And you don't need all that. Your mind is the military. Your mind is the weapon. And you need to use your mind to protect yourself. Right after uh, slavery, of course, we had, you know, the jump start to Black Wall Street. Now, we were fresh out of slavery. We still had the skills to toil the ground and to, and to grow what we need, and that very well helped. That was a basic skill towards, towards nation building. However, uh, I'll say one grave mistake that we made was that we did not erect a, a military structure alongside that civilization. Security, to defend ourselves. Remember I talked about the economy? Well, we had economy in Tulsa, but what happened to that? We need to be able to defend that. We need to have our young generations of young African-American men and women be able to defend the nation that they live in. And we need to have that strong concept, whether it is the Fruit of Islam's concept, whether it is the Moorish Science Temple concept, whether it is the Black Panther concept, whatever it is, we have to defend by any means necessary our people, our children, and our nation. Study your history. Act like any other thing in nature acts. Something tries to kill you, kill it first. That's the law of nature. To sit down and be killed and be abused and mutilized, then to have the killer giving you a religion to rationalize this as normal is total insanity. The military is a way of thinking. That's why I mentioned the misdirection, deception.
You have to think military to be military. You have to be in that spirit. Don't look for anything. The computer is a weapon. Everything is run with computer, drones, supplies, everything. You have the weapon. You can go to this, get a $99 laptop or whatever. You have the weapon. Everything you need to defeat them, they bring to you. It's learn to work with your hands, learn to uh, grow your own food, uh, you know, fetch your own water, things of that nature, uh, even if it's electrical work or even barbering, because hand skills translate to other things as well. Hand skills, I'll say that, but primarily each and every person should be able to to go to the earth to pull from nature their needs. What you can do right now is to realize who you are, to know that you are descendants of geniuses, not just kings and queens. Yeah, less than one tenth of one percent of our population was kings and queens. The mass majority of Africans were scientists, were doctors, were engineers, were architects, were laborers, were teachers, were engineers, we're thinkers. That's the vast majority of our population. And that is in your DNA. That's in your DNA. We carry that with us. So this system, in order to maintain itself, has to suppress that innate genius that's inside of you. As surface football was, as segregated as it was, in my final year, final year, I was the most valuable player of the league. I wasn't sitting down complaining about not having an opportunity. I applied myself till I was desired to on a level that they didn't mind giving me <laughs> the MVP award. I told my students in, in my class uh, last uh, last spring, I said, I'm gonna give you twenty dollars and I want you to go to get I want you to go to the store and I want you to get me five dollars worth of lack. I want you to get me ten dollars worth of scarcity. I want you to go ahead and get me a pound and a half worth of poverty. And my students say, well, Dr. Kimbrough, that doesn't exist. You can't buy that. And I said, it does exist. Well, where does it exist? It exists in your mind. The greatest gift your creator has ever given you is the ability to change your mind. And nothing's going to change until you change your mind. And most people that think they're conscious and aware won't talk to the Negroes who's into pig feet and ham hocks and praise the Lord. But those are the people you need. Everyone is, has a value when you're trying to change your system. The alcoholic can be used, they can make a Molotov cocktail out of an empty wine bottle. You have to know how to use all of them. The crackheads, uh, you can't trash anyone. Everyone is needed in this struggle, and that's what an organizer does. They don't do that sort of thing. But we're looking for conscious people, and no, no. All I need is a few good men. That's what the Marines say. Oh, you don't need all those people, you just need a few good men. Black women, are in the forefront of this movement again and it's, it's a return of uh, what's called the, the black goddess force, the black goddess concept uh, and that is in direct opposition to the male god concept. Now, the only way this, this dominant energy that's hell-bent on destroying everything and everybody could be neutralized is an equally powerful and opposing force which is not coming in the form of the black woman. So that's the era that we're moving into and nothing that that these white supremacists do can stop that. We have a lot of young people who are victims of sexual abuse, who are victims of physical abuse. Uh, that has to stop. And granted, it's a replication of what has happened to them, but we have to stop turning our heads. When we know that something is going on I'm wrong, we have to step in. Remember back in the day, I said, next door neighbor took care of you and made sure that mama knew you, you screwed up. We, we need to be able to, to develop that love relationship again that we, with each other. And the third thing is B. That means build. And you build your economy. And you build by having an empowerment mindset. It's not about hitting the lottery. It's not about getting a record contract. It's not about getting a, a football contract. It's all about everything you do, your actions, everything you think should be about building and empowering yourself as a melanoid person. Now what we need to do is convince one million black people to find one to three banks that they support and take 100, I would love to do it just with one bank. When you take one million black people to take $100 and on one day deposit it into that was black, at one black bank. That one black bank gains a $100 million in acquisition in one day and they can start making loans out against that money.
for homes the next day. Your GDP is $1.7 trillion. You are 13% of the population, but you are one-tenth of the U.S. economy. I told you there are 35,000 black millionaires in the United States. You are equal to Qatar. Qatar is one of the wealthiest countries on the face of the earth. You have 35,000 black millionaires in the United States. There are a pool of 34 million African Americans. You have 30,000 individuals in Qatar who are millionaires, but there are less than a million people who live in Qatar. Why? Because they talk economic development. Because they talk entrepreneurship. They're all over the world building businesses. Get over this victim mentality, black America. Get over this damn it, oh, woe is me. Your creator doesn't know anything about that. Quit trying to limit the unlimited and see how far you can go. Their God is money. They speak of God more on their currency than in the Bible. Because every bill, every coin says, in God we trust. It don't say, in the word of God we trust. It says, in God we trust, and in God is their money. Take their money. I think getting back to cooperative farming, uh, and in the instances in the inner cities where you cannot do that, you forming food co-ops among African groups, African people in America, and buying your foods from people who grow organic foods is critical. Because people say, oh, it's expensive. Not if you have a co-op, it's not expensive. So we have to look at that as a factor. We need to look at economics. Need to look at that. Need to understand what economics is. And although I realize that money could be the root of all evil, it's also the root of success if you use it properly. We have to be real clear. We've got to spend our money in order that our nation is able to rise up out of this. I'm not into nation building, I'm into empire building. And to do that, you have to have a strong economic base. The first thing we need to do is study our history. The second thing we need to do is any businesses that do not serve our community, that treat us like they are parasites and we sacrifice, they stop being their sacrifice by putting our money in our pocket and finding someplace else to spend it. We made a trillion dollars last year and we gave it to the people who hate our guts. Let's take that trillion dollars and open businesses for ourselves. We need to get serious about business. We need to get serious about entrepreneurship. We need to get serious about building residual income streams. And we need to find ways of being able to second generation it and pass it on to the next generation and they have to be instructed, the second generation, have to be instructed. This is what I've passed down to you. Multiply it by 10 and pass that down to your children. And then essentially we then keep that program rolling. We need to go into our bookstores, into uh, go online to all of the black businesses, and we have to start to subscribe to them and we start purchasing things. I do realize there are some things that, are, that, that, that our people do not manufacture that we need. I understand that. And under those circumstances, of course, you need to get your product. I am saying, let's do a, a concerted effort looking for businesses that reflect us and do for us and keep that dollar circulating in the community as many times as we possibly can before it leaves. And that's why people who say our history ain't nothing work so hard to keep it away from us. When you know who you are, you know what to do next about your well-being.